Hi, everyone. My name is James Evanotakis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Australian American Fulbright Commission, and welcome to this edition of In Conversation. Today, we're lucky enough to be joined by uh, Dr. Paul Harper, who's a 2019 Fulbright Scholar and an Associate Professor at the School of Law at the University of Queensland. Now, Paul's just been awarded an ARC Future Fellowship, which is focused on ensuring greater inclusion at universities. So, Paul, welcome. And maybe we can start if you could tell us a little bit about the origins of your project. Well, I, well I've never, I'd never really thought of trying for a Future Fellowship because the people that get them are visionary and far thinking. But after applying and successfully getting a Fulbright, I thought, well, if I'm good enough for Fulbright, I'm good enough for anything. So I decided to take a punch at something which I hope will transform higher education for staff with disabilities into the future. And if you help staff with disabilities, that helps students with disabilities because universities are in a, a particularly privileged position where if you employ staff with disabilities to lead disability inclusion, those staff support the students with disabilities by mentoring them and offering them um, championship within the higher education sector. Staff with disabilities also impact upon students without disabilities by giving them the privilege of a full education and to see how people with disabilities can succeed. Now, staff with disabilities um, are academics and academics all engage in research and innovation. If you're an academic engaging in research and innovation on disability inclusion, you're directly changing society. If you're an architect or an engineer or an IT specialist or any other area, if you have a disability, you're gonna include disability in your projects. So an architect in a wheelchair, for example, isn't going to design a building without a ramp. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that I, a lot of my work has been um, focused on, in, in the university sector, a lot of my background has been focused on promoting diversity, not mm -hmm. just at universities, but, you know, in the sort of the arts and cultural sectors. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, especially, I think, you know, and a lot of people challenge that idea and say, well, why do you need diversity? But you're spot on, right? You bring a very specific perspective. If you are if you come from a diverse background or you, you come with a specific disability, you, you add to the richness of not only the, the research and the policy making, but also the experience of the students. And also, if you think about diversity as a group, diversity is almost the majority. If you, there's arguments between 15 and 20% of the population have a disability, but if you make it accessible, universal accessibility, and that, that's what my Fulbright was focused on, universal access, because when you make it universally accessible, that doesn't mean you're making it accessible for people with disabilities. It doesn't mean you're making it accessible for someone pushing a pram, a dad or a mum pushing their kid in a pram. It doesn't mean you're making it accessible for older people who maybe using a walker or, or someone who's had a motorbike accident is on using crutches. The idea is you make it accessible for everyone as far as possible. And then society is more inclusive and the need for adaptation and retro, retrofitting areas is reduced. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such important. I, I think it's such an important way to look at it, that it's not necessarily about making it for one group, it's about making it for everybody. And that, that directly relates to your, you know, the experience that you had in, at Harvard in, with your Fulbright. So can you tell us a little bit about, a little bit about that a bit before talking to, let's go back a little bit before going yeah. forward, talking about yeah. your future work. Well, when I got the Fulbright, um, I was over the moon. I mean, it was, it's transformational getting a Fulbright because you, become part of an elite club of exceptionally successful people. And like everybody else, I always go, I don't know how come I got it and I feel like an imposter. But once I got to Harvard Law School, I looked around and realized just what a transformational place it was and the capacity to make change and see change occurring. So you can see, for example, the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities swept in through the UN in, the, in late 2006, was adopted faster than any other convention. And at that point, for example, development aid didn't really include disabilities. And if it did, it was very ad hoc. Now you've got the World Bank, the biggest funder in the world, including disability in all its programs, mainstream and inclusion. So you think about the impact that will have across the globe as projects now include disability. So the rebuilding of cities will think about inclusivity. We're in a we're in a space now when anything is possible, and part I hope on my on my future fellowship that the impossible becomes possible. And one of the one of the areas that you 
that you talk about is ability barriers. Can you can you tell us what you mean by that and how how they prevent um, you know people with disabilities from uh, equitable access and equitable participation? A simple a simple day I think illustrates how ability barriers can hinder, frustrate a person. So I walked to the bus today and I was going to a different location. So I have to work out online, where does the bus go? Or I get a taxi, but I thought I'd get the bus. So I get on the bus and then I have to, I use my GPS to navigate when it's time to get off the bus. But if you go through a tunnel, GPS stops. So those are just added stresses that a person with eyesight, because I'm totally blind, would be able to walk up to the bus stop, read the timetable and hop on much easier. So there's small things that add a little bit to your day. But then I'm on the bus and I was being the sort of person I am, I'm working on my laptop and I was trying to navigate a database to gra grab something and it wasn't fully accessible. It was in a, a PDF image. So before I can read that, I then have to convert that into a format that's readable. Takes a few more, this takes a minute here. Then I wanted to listen to a, a speech. The database, sorry, the um, platform it's on, I can't click on the button for some reason. So I'm emailing the, I email the person and say, look, what's, what's going on? I mean, being a, a lawyer, if it doesn't get fixed, I'll probably send, a, send them a slightly more aggressive note because it should be fixed and other people won't have the opportunity to flick it to someone for help. But all of those things, it takes a little bit of time here and a little bit of time there. And if you think about it, it takes 10 minutes a day, 10 minutes by 365 adds up to a significant amount. And so all of those small barriers can be um, reduce your day. And then there are big barriers. So if your workplace requires you to use a database which is no longer accessible. And that happened in the US. So a colleague of mine was working in a, a retail in a hotel chain and the new human resource system that he had to use on a daily basis was upgraded and the upgrade didn't work with his screen reader. So he was no longer able to work in his job and he had to leave. So that was a real world opportunity he had. It was okay you know, money, had to then find a new job because of an upgrade. He could have sued, but the trouble is we're suing it. It can um, result in other you know, negative barriers in the future where people get to know you're blacklisted. So he chose instead of suing to ease his way out and find another position. Um, the University of Queensland, our HR system wasn't accessible. Um, we tried everything to make it accessible, but fortunately we have adopted a, a procurement policy to only purchase accessible systems as we go forward. The new HR system, when we were purchasing it, which is just being rolled out now, is accessible. And we, that was one of the factors in its purchase. And that sends a message when, when, a, when you're going to spend, I think it was hundreds of thousands on a system on for years, you send to the, the supplier, we need this, this has to be fully inclusive for people with disability. Is it? If it's not, um, we'll be going somewhere else. Well, that, that's a lot of money. Your customers are telling you this is important to us. And if you don't have it working for everyone, well, we're not going to play, we're not going to buy your product. So they that immediately sends a, a message to their developers that our clients demand this, so therefore fix it. It's it's such a it's such a great example. And and maybe we can continue that thread. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean you talked about your experience at, at University of Queensland, but what what can universities um do more broadly about, you know, about in, ensuring that they're more inclusive with uh, people with disabilities? One very simple thing, which costs nothing, is include the disability voice. Include people with disabilities on committees, on groups. If you think about every university has students with disabilities. In Australia, most universities will have between four and 8% of their student population asking for accommodations. At the University of Queensland, we have around 8% of our student population reporting a disability and about 4% who come forward saying they need help. And if you think about that, across Australia, we have about 1.5 million university students. So 4% of them are significant, sufficiently disabled to request support, then that's a huge population to draw from when you have a committee. And you should have equality across those committees, particularly in the, in the student space where there's a, they're a significant percentage and they're visible. In the staff space, there are a lot less staff with disabilities. There's a pipeline gap where if you go from undergrad to master's and higher degree, there are, the, the numbers of percent, the percentage of people with disabilities goes down. 
And then it gets entry level, it goes down again. And as you climb higher and higher, each step of the way, there's less and less. And if you go for, through most universities and look and click on the, the photos of all the professors, you're going to find very few in those full professors in wheelchairs or with guide dogs who have visible disability, people with visible, visible disabilities. And that's that's really important. I think the the idea of of you know that's I mean that's, that's something else that I think is is really important about the idea of growing a pipeline, like actually working with students and to, you know getting them to think about research as a career and academia as a career and sort of you know maybe in second or third year starting to develop programs that encourage you know those students to 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 enter the 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 sector. I think it would make a significant contribution to the sector. And, and it, it will. And, and a good example was uh, when I came to UQ, there was no, no one with a disability involved with monitoring the disability action plan, which I thought was a bit um, odd. So I walked across to the chancellor and knocked on the vice chancellor's door, literally, and it got opened. And um, the secretary sent me down the hall to the workplace diversity and inclusion group who were drafting the next plan, got me involved, and then my group was written into the next plan. Which started a few months later. And yeah, that, that's yeah. a, sorry, sorry to cut you off. That's a, that's a fantastic story. All, all I was going to say was, I, you know, I remember a good friend of mine who's um, this happened relatively recently. Actually, she's got cerebral palsy and, and relies on a, a wheelchair. And um, you know, the, the university that she was at spent a lot of money redesigning the the grounds, uh, but then remove in, in so doing removed one of the plat the the ramps and so she had to go right around the university and she did complain and they actually went back and retrofitted it retrofitted the work but if you get you know if you, like you said if, if a student with a disability had been included earlier mm -hmm. and up front in the in the consultation committee it would have made a massive difference um and, and it makes a big difference and we've got um from this group we've got the people the key directors of all the center the areas working on it and like our property and facilities um director tim sweeney is amazing and really interested in advocacy there's a huge development going in and at the UQ, like one of the a big, I forgot the correct term, but it's like one of the, uh, one of the larger developments and that will have, um, not just a disabled tour, but change rooms and a lot of carer spaces so have actually, it's really designed in. Um, and our vice chancellor and deputy provost and provost, like the, the senior leadership team is on board with the inclusivity. And so that makes a really big difference when the question's asked, um, how how is this is this diverse? How are we factored in diversity? And when it's asked at the top level, then the people at all the way down have to answer that question. Well, that 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 makes such a that leadership as well that that um, high level leadership makes such a massive difference. So, um, so let's just get, let's go back about uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the Fulbright program. Um, in 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 Boston, um, you mentioned to us that you had um, connected with. A Fulbright chapter that is uh, being set up with awardees with disabilities. Um, can you tell us about how that's going? Because I, I know it's in its infancy, but you have made some progress. Yeah, well, I, when I was going across on my Fulbright, I was a Fulbrighter with a disability, and there wasn't a group of Fulbrighters with a disability. There were Fulbrighters with disabilities that I connected with, or former Fulbrighters, but there was no group. And since then, I've been contacted by a group who has just started up and has state department funding and they've built a website, but it's very much in the infancy of former Fulbrighters with disabilities. And um, so which I think is absolutely critical. So that, that will give the, with a voice support, connect people up. And I, I'm pretty excited that it's gonna be a global chapter. Um, so everyone across the globe can connect. I mean, these days with Zoom, we're used to connecting even potentially, well, in some jurisdictions you connect with the people next door via computer. The moment so it's it's a really good time to set this up and I'm, I'm very excited because I think it's a space where we have a lot of visionaries and a lot of really inspiring people who are Fulbrighters and a lot of them have disabilities and to get the that group of people together I think will drive some real big change so we'll, I think getting a group of Fulbrighters with disabilities together will drive some significant change and really provide a platform for future Fulbrighters to go to and get advice and for potential Fulbrighters to see what can happen. And, and just as important, I think, to, to uh, advise Fulbright commissions about how to run our program better and for us to be more inclusive as well. Cause I'm sure that, you know, we're, we're I'm sure that, you know, um, we're, we're part of the challenge as well. We probably add that 10 minutes to your day that you mentioned. 
Um, so what, what can we, what can organizations and scholarship programs such as Fulbright uh, do to, to better support um, applicants with disabilities and ensure that we have um, you know, equal access? Well, I've got to say the Fulbright Commission didn't add um, much time. They're actually really supportive. So I have to give you a plug there because the, I think also the benefit with Fulbright Commission is the people you're dealing with are all incredibly motivated and switched on. So I suspect most people who are, are awarded a Fulbright will come to the commission and say, here's what, here's is what I need, here's how you can help me, and here's some um, ideas. The benefit of having a chapter with a disability is all when all those work workarounds and solutions will be able to be collected in one spot. And it's easier for, say, the Australian Fulbright Commission, when you have a Fulbright with a disability, if there's a disability chapter, you could connect the person up with them and then probably find out other examples of how other commissions around the world have dealt with a particular issue. So it's about sharing information and um, resources on how solutions are being reached. So Paul, thank you so much for joining us today and I really look forward to collaborating with you going forward. And thank you for the opportunity to participate again.